Ladies and gentlemen, stick around. We've got Ideas by Elliot. Hey, folks, you're listening to Ideas by Elliot. And we're here with Ideas by Elliot. Podcast, podcast, (laughs) podcast. Welcome to Ideas by Elliot with your host, Elliot Christensen, web guru, entrepreneur extraordinaire, you name it, he does it. Today's special guest is Brian Simons, the executive director of the Brown County Library System. And here's Elliot. Oh my gosh, that was a great intro. It was. Hey, Brian, how's it going? Good. How about yourself? Uh, Amazing. So you are with Brown County Library. You head things up. Yeah, we've got a lot going on right now. I've been here, oh, about a year, uh, a little over a year. In that year, we've been uh, very productive. The facilities, for those who've been to the Brown County Library, know that they're, they're dated, let's call it. The central facilities, 44 years old and shows it in spots which by spots, I mean most of it. But we were able to get some things through funding for some renovations and some other things throughout the system. So one of the first things was we were able to expand the Southwest branch. So we just had a ribbon cutting there uh, this week on Tuesday. Uh, So that's nice. It was was a very small neighborhood branch, but they now have, uh, we call it the library living room. So it's a space about... 15 by 15 that southwest branch yeah that's one on 9th street correct so there was talk maybe two years ago about closing it down it was that same year last year last year so it went from because this is our world works in brown county (laughs) yeah so this is how things go in brown county uh it went from being closed in one meeting to 30 days later not only keeping it open having finding the funding to keep it open but finding funding to expand it so we were able to expand it. So we'll so, take the good when we can. Who was talking about closing it and why were they thinking uh, that was Library good? Board was talking about closing it. And it's been an ongoing thing way before I got here, probably for the past 20 years. It's been talked about as possibly closing it. There were quite a few reasons. One is when we don't have funding to run the entire operation, because we're really not nine libraries we're one library with nine locations and a bookmobile so we can't take individual libraries into account separately we have to take it into account as a whole and when we don't have enough funding to operate the entire thing something's got to give that particular facility especially at that time was one of the smallest we had and it was in the, the place where the closest proximity to other branches of ours would be so it's about two miles from the central facility and two miles from the ashwabanon facility Hmm. where when you look at the other facilities they're all about four or five miles from the next facility or much further out like our rural areas where we can't really close denmark or pulaski because now we're talking you know 15 miles away just to get to one of our facilities strategically That would be bad, too, because there's all these cross-border payments with the separate counties or the border counties. So if you have residents like in Pulaski where they're right on the border, they could go to Shano and then Brown County would be paying Shano for a service. Okay. As opposed to paying just paying for it ourselves and serving our own residents. What happens now is because we have a branch out there, Shano residents actually come to the Pulaski branch more than ours go to theirs so we see a net gain of funding because okay. shano's paying us for serving their patrons as you can see it's a lot more complicated than just should we close it or not well things usually are yeah, yeah. that's where it, it kind of stemmed from was we just didn't have the operational funding from after cut after cut after cut for the past you know many many years but especially the last probably four or five and you know everywhere in the county no one was really all that safe as a department because of the downturn in the economy and and whatnot. This was kind of the the signal of, okay, we we can't go any further. We can't fund something out of nothing. So they stepped up. The county board was, saw library service as an important thing. And not only did they fund it well enough to be sustained operationally, they funded it well enough with some outlay money to expand it a little bit. 
So you were talking about the county board. Yep. Okay, that's where the funding comes from. Correct. How does the library board fit into that? That's a good question. The whole library system is a lot more complicated than the rest of whether it's municipal or county, wherever you live. It's a lot more complicated than your typical department because the library board is semi-autonomous board that runs the library. They're appointed by the executive. So if it's like in our case, the county uh, executive, Troy Streckenbach appoints the library board members for three-year terms and they're on staggered terms. So not everybody turns over at once. If you're in a municipality that has a library, so if uh, you're listening outside of our area, it, your uh, city administrator or mayor probably appoints that board. So is that how it's always structured? Yeah, so by state law, by Wisconsin law, chapter 43, okay. that is what dictates uh, library service. And the reason for it is actually pretty good. And this has been this way for over a hundred years. Um, so those who thought of library service many, many, years before the internet or anything like that were pretty freewheeling and, and good thinkers because they could really see that if the library was also run by the county executive or the county board who also funds it, it's very easy for someone to say, well, you shouldn't have that type of book or you shouldn't have that type of material because I disagree with it morally, ethically. And then cut the budget because you carry something like that or okay. put handcuffs on the library where libraries are really one of your op more open uh, institutions where we carry things for everyone. We'll take homosexuality, for example. We have books with characters in them that are homosexual. We sure. have books about okay. homosexuality. And if there were someone in the elected office that said, well, we're not doing that and they made a big stink out of it, and it was not run by a separate library board, they would be able just to say, get those out of there. So the library board kind of allows that distance. The library board deals with that part and the county board deals with the funding piece. So I say semi-autonomous because what happens is the county board appropriates money as opposed to allocates, which it does with all the other departments. So once the money is given to the library, it's the library board's money. We can They can spend it however they want, but semi-autonomous because if you did spend it exactly however you wanted, good luck getting funding again the next year. So there's still a tie that you have to abide by. <laughs> <laughs> At least last year, we were talking about doing some like more educational programs. Yeah. So what's going on with that? A lot of stuff. We've been teaching Arduino classes. So for those who are, are listening who don't know what Arduino is, it's similar to Raspberry Pi. And if you don't know what that is, it's a, a little microcomputer about the size of your credit card that you can plug a regular computer into and code into it, then unplug and your little microcomputer does whatever you've coded it to do. So you can hook it up to thermometers, moisture sensors, motors, really you name it, the sky's the limit with this thing. We teach kids and adults for that matter, it started with kids and the, the adults that were, were there watching their kids were peering over them, bobbing and weaving, trying to see what was going on. Like, well, what are you doing? I'm, I'm really interested. So we did some adult classes too, and they were full in a heartbeat. When you say full. We do 10 at a time because that's what we can handle with the like equipment we have. 10 people. Yeah, okay. yep. We've probably done I'd say in the neighborhood of 20 classes. Wow. Yeah. So so what we do is we teach kids and adults that are there mm -hmm. to basically code to turn on an LED light. And then we teach them how to turn it off mm -hmm. with coding and teach them how to wire a button in. And and then somewhere in there, we purposely break the code. We, we leave out a thing or two. So they have to find it. And it's amazing because it's really a great metaphor because when they turn on the light the first time, you see the light bulb go off in their head like, mm -hmm. oh, I can maybe do this. And then when they find the broken code, they really are like, this isn't magic. I control this. This is cool. I code something and I make something in this completely metaphysical world in the computer screen happen in the real world. And it's really cool to watch people just like light up. And then you start hearing them go, you know what I could do with this? especially the kids, they just go off. You know, one kid wanted to make a, a separate remote to bug his brother with it, to turn the TV on and off. 
and you could i mean it would right. be it would not be that hard to do with the, with an arduino so what we do then after they've gone to that introduction class then they're welcome to come to our arduino club classes so that's kind of come as you are when you want you can bring a project that you're working on talk it through with other people but we always have a project we're going to do a more advanced project at that club meeting cool so we've done a secret knock door unlocker which is exactly what it sounds like you program a knock in and it will if you do the knock it will open the door and then you can reprogram it to other knocks we've done uh with solenoids uh super mario brothers theme song uh, so just by screws electrically turning in and out it makes the sounds to make that song it's a blast. Those folks, mostly kids, have just an amazing time. And then, again, you just get their their juices flowing with that kind of thing. In addition to that, kind of adjunct to that, we've got Proto upstairs in our third floor. Uh, for those who maybe are unfamiliar with Proto, Proto is a nonprofit in town, and they're a makerspace. So what makerspaces are, I like to call them like an inventor's paradise. So it's really for folks who love to tinker. They're kind of are starting out, but we have them up there to really play off of a lot of the things that we're doing. And they have the expertise and the equipment to really build some cool stuff. So they're going to be doing some programming specifically with the library coming up probably in the next couple months. And we'll be doing six programs with them, plus a year long program with them, really more like a project. And it's Cardboard Green Bay is the project. So they're gonna make a, a model of downtown Green Bay that's gonna be about four or five, eight by four sheets of plywood laid out. That's how big it'll be. And it'll start off very basic with just the in-scale, probably cardboard squares to mark where buildings are. And then as the project goes on, they'll use CNC routing machines with through programming. They'll use uh, 3D printers, things like that to really build these buildings in scale and make them look as much like the building as possible. Then they'll go on to the next phase, which is illumination. So they'll use that Arduino technology and put little LED lights for street lights and traffic lights and things. Wow, that's cool. Yeah, they, they want to put in a, a liquid river and have bridges go up and down, obeying RFID tags with boats and with cars. The last one is motion. It'd be like the ultimate train set. Like, That's exactly what I'm envisioning. Yeah. With an added perk of augmented reality was the final step. For those who may not know what augmented reality is, it's basically a looks like a dot, kind of like a, a QR code almost, but even more inconspicuous because it just looks like a black dot. You have an app that you point your phone or whatever device at, and it reads that and it pulls up whatever you want it to pull up. So you program in. So for instance, a good example would be the Northland Hotel. So they'll have a, a image of the Northland. If there's a dot on top, you can point your phone at that and pictures of the 1924 original 11 pictures of once a month, they took a photo of that building going up with hand tools. And in 11 months, that building went up in 1924. Isn't that cool? So we can do a time lapse and just show that. And then wow. another screen comes up. We could tell the brief history of it or like or Schreiber's new building, you could tell the story of Schreiber. So it's really kind of a, a neat way to, to engage kids, not only in the technical aspects of building, uh, not only in, which I think is maybe one of the coolest things about Proto, is all these things are projects that you have to work as a team on. And that's one of their big tenants is, not only do they teach these STEM concepts, the science, te technology, engineering, math, but really the real benefit is learning those soft skills that employers really want that the schools have a hard time doing because they're focused on teaching what they have to teach just right. academically it's very rigid yeah yeah they're going to get a lot of these skills and learn how to be team players and and leaders when they should be and leaders when they shouldn't be how to work out differences and conflict how to be innovative all of those things are going to are wrapped up in each one of these projects the final piece is with that augmented reality it really pulls them into the community in a way that just building the model does a little but then learning about each one of these places gives them that rooted that that home rootedness of like wow this is we actually have some really cool stuff here maybe i don't need to leave when i after high school maybe i stick around so and go to school around that's here. a separate nonprofit. That, Correct. Okay. Correct. And we're, we basically have structured libraries have 
probably the last 10 years have been putting maker spaces in. And what they've been doing though, is they've been buying the equipment, but then nobody knows how to run the equipment. And some of it's kind of dangerous. I mean, like a laser cutter, it's a laser cutter. Right. <laughs> you will you will mess yourself up if you don't know what you're doing with that thing. We, I think, stumbled on the right way to do this, which is to find a makerspace group mm-hmm. that wants to really make this their job and work with them and give them the space or you know, rent them the space for, for a reasonable price. And now you've got a good partnership. They've got people coming in uh, that normally wouldn't, and you've got what what you've been trying to get, which is that 21st century relevance of a library. And really, when you think about it, we're not, while it sounds kind of crazy that Mm -hmm. the library's got this, it's really no different than what we've always done. What we've always done is we've been an avenue to learn. We've been an avenue to get information. But in today's world and, and going forward, that learning isn't in books. Like I can't learn how to computer program by reading it. I have to, tr- I have to try it, I have to right. do it. I can't learn how to build a scale model without building a scale model. And I can't learn how to prototype, which is where the proto, the word, you know, their name comes from, without thinking through the idea, going through the process, having someone help guide that process, and then build the prototype. Their bigger goal, which is pretty cool, and I'm really happy that the library is associated with it, is once they get more established is to have membership, and then membership can come in during their open hours and work on their own ideas. They already have had a gentleman who had uh, an idea to make something, and he said, you know, I don't, I don't have any understanding of manufacturing. I don't know how this all works, but I've got this idea. And they said, you know, we can help you get to the prototype stage, and then we can even help you with our contacts because they've been in this kind of industry and engineering and and locally for 35, 40 years amongst all three of the guys who are running it. So they have all these contacts with short run manufacturers. And so they, they said, well, yeah, we'll put you in touch with them. They'll make 20 of them. You sell the 20. If you sell them real fast, you know, you got something. If you sell them and you get some feedback, you know where you've got to change things. If nothing happens, you haven't wasted your, your life. You haven't wasted your savings on something that really wasn't going to happen anyway. So it's kind of a neat thing that they're doing that one, it's not even an incubator. It's almost like a, it's prior to an incubator. It's almost like the seed starter of is something viable enough for me to try it. And if it's not, thank God I tried it here and didn't try to just make this a business and waste years of my life and, you know, my kid's college fund and whatever. It's pretty cool that they're they're doing this. And um, one of the other things, not to puff them up too much, but I'm just so proud that they're... Honestly, I think that people don't know that it's there. Yeah, they I mean, don't. I mean, if, unless they know it's there, they have they would have no reason to even look for yeah, it. Yeah, so. and, and, and we're going to start marketing. They're going to start marketing. And yeah. once we get our programs together, people will, I think, will know more about them as we work with them with our programs. But one of the other things they are doing, and it is at the library, is they run the robotics teams in the area. And they did pretty well. They accomplished the goal with the high school robotics team. It was the most of them were newbies. They never had done it before. But with their middle school underwater aquatics robot team, they won regionals and they went to nationals and there were like 90 some teams there. And while by no means did they even break the top half, they weren't last. (laughs) I think they were somewhere in the 70s, he said. But they were really happy because it was just there's a bunch bunch of of middle school kids that did everything. They had to wire a circuit board and the guys really did not do it they just kind of showed them how and helped them think through things they really put the hands-on piece with the kids it's neat to watch them work to be able to go all the way down to baton rouge and compete against you know 90 other teams that's pretty cool that's very cool yeah and that's just coming right out of our own backyard you know with with minimal to no funding they were able to pull that off if you know if we can get more knowledge about it, more kids who are interested um, and are looking for that avenue. Wow. You know, they could possibly even start placing at nationals. Pretty cool. It's great to hear this kind of education happening, too, because it's graduation season. I've been working a lot for the school (laughs) districts, right? I was thinking that. And (laughs) I just had a conversation with a, a teacher yesterday. She's an English teacher. And she said, if you are a qualified tech ed teacher, 
you can name your price and work anywhere. It's amazing how that has really changed from when, you know, I can speak for Elliot and I, because we're, we went to grade school together. Ageism is coming about. Yeah, a little I, bit. I, I feel that. Yeah. Yeah. We're in a protected class now. I, start, I <laughs> Okay. So, so just to loop back on that, when you mentioned that the library was 44 years old and it's crumbling, I'm like, I can totally relate right. to that. So, so am I. I know. Like I've got, I've got a knee that kind of doesn't work right anymore and an ankle. Yeah. So, but yeah, when, when we were in school, the tech ed was kind of like the, well, that's where the, you know, that's where the car guys went. That's where the quote unquote meatheads went. But now it's like, no, that stuff is for real. I live out in Algoma and they have Olson Manufacturing gave a ton, donated a ton of money to build a like state of the art facility. And they've got real, I mean, huge CNC routers that do metal fabrication. And I just all this equipment that I look at and go, all I want is a table saw. Like, where's where's that? I remember that in tech ed. We never had access to this never. cool stuff like it's computer all programmed. Changed. And it's all changed. It's and everything amazing. is like interlaced. And, yeah. Uh, I always say the things that I thought were important when I was in school ended up not being important at all. Like, yep. yeah, I needed a little bit of math in order to be able to program. Yep. But actually it's not that much math right and that's what i put all my energy into is math and science and i don't use any science <laughs> um, and i mean the things that you learn in science most of it you can google now but uh, what it did probably build is a way of thinking it could have yeah and it's hard to, to unravel that right. and, and know how much that stuff impacted it i didn't go to a lot of communication classes right. <laughs> and here you are hosting podcast well, shows <laughs> <laughs> I, that was a little bit of a softball, uh, and I and I uh, I build websites, yeah. and I didn't yeah. take a lot of art classes, yeah, uh, it, and I didn't know that I needed that, right? Uh, so you know, being well rounded, I feel like these things, these disciplines, kind of coming together, it's good for all sorts of unforeseen reasons, even. It it really is, yeah. and and that's one of the pieces that the library is trying to do, just not you know outside of Proto, outside of our other programming, um, just with with all the things that we do with programming, is not only build the literacy piece but build that social emotional piece because that when I, you know, when I talk to employers, I was talking to, uh, I think his name is Mark at Linquist um, here in town. And he said the hardest thing they have to, to, in terms of hiring is not people with the hard skills. It's people with the soft skills. You know, how, how can they, how can they get along with people? Can they work together as a team? How, how creative can they be and how can they communicate that? Those are the things they have a hard time finding. And that's where I think the library programming really steps in and helps out because even with young kids, if they're at a story time together, they have to interact. And a lot of those kids come and they don't know each other. And they learn that interaction and that social engagement piece that you would not get otherwise. And that's just at the very young age. And then when you get into the older you know, programming that we do, um, even if it's... Um, for that matter, with adults, are uh, we're doing a? Um, it's called Good Sense. It's a financial literacy, for lack of a better word, financial literacy program, and it's system wide. And we have at least one program a month uh, somewhere in our system, and it's everything from how do I go about buying a home. Um, so we're working like with NeighborWorks and giving them another venue to kind of tap into. Um, we're working with financial planners on a million different possibilities. So everything from retirement to saving for a college education to uh, one of the things we did was book discussion. Uh, I'm going to draw a blank on the title now, but it basically was around Christmas time or right after Christmas. And it was all about how do I get my kids to not be so materialistic? <laughs> you know, like why, what's, what's really important and how do I get them in the, to understand how money works? So we've also done, are those geared mostly for kids? Those are geared actually mostly for adults. Um, those are, those are, are uh, some of our adult programming yeah. that we've been doing and it's been pretty successful. There's times uh, where we're competing with freshly good weather, yeah. Uh, or something like that, that we haven't had a, a good warm day. Well, I, I guess, okay, when I asked yeah. kids, I guess I was thinking like people that are 20. <laughs> right, yeah. Well, so, there's a little of both. Because you said, you know, you can, uh, well, how to teach your kids. And yeah. people that have kids, I think of as being more our age. So yeah. it's yeah. a little of both. Um, so it's everything from your, so we've, we've done social security programs where we've gotten folks that are right up against that retirement age. Um, we've gotten folks that are in their 20s going, yeah, I've had this great young professional job and 
I get paid kind of a lot of money and I don't have anything to show for it. Maybe it's time I learn how to do this. So we've, we've had the whole gamut, right? We've, we've had, right. and you're smiling because I feel like you were there at one point. Oh, I'm still there. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was definitely there at one point up until, you know, not too long ago. Brian Johnson, he has all sorts of interesting things to say about you. Oh, oh of course he does. <laughs> and of course he gets, that's, yeah. So those who weren't at his roast, he has the best initials ever. I do. So. I do. It's true. It's true. Wow. <laughs> wow. Uh, I'm going to, that'll be fun. I can't wait to call him later. <laughs> I, I can imagine. He had other things. I, I'll, I, I'll yeah, those yeah. out. Well, you know, I'll I do. Save that. I do deserve it. I do deserve <laughs> it. If, if any of you listening were at his roast, you know, I deserve it. It was pretty fun. It was we fun. had a good time with yeah. him. And, uh, and it's been really great being back in the community and reconnecting with folks like you and like, yeah. and, and connecting originally now with Brian and others who, you know, I think there's a good, I can't even say a core group, just a, a lot of people really doing some amazing things, moving this area forward yeah. in ways that I never thought it would. So, it's pretty cool. So I always take a break and talk a little bit about Camera Corner Studios. Yeah, yeah, I'll be gone for a week. The the studios and some of our equipment is heading out to Ohio to work at the country festival. That's so, crazy. That's so you're cool. like national. Yeah, I mean, you go everywhere. We only have one location. I, right. I mean, as far as the promotion and yeah, the, but you're in demand. Yeah, we're we're busy. Uh, but you know, there is room in the room. So if you're looking to shoot or record a podcast or something, let us know. We're actually uh, possibly looking at ramping up staff a little bit too, to help with some of those situations so you've been rocking it so you want to drop your phone number i can do that nine two zero two seven two zero one four eight two seven two zero one four eight i'm not trying to name drop here because i don't even know who the guy is but everybody tells me dirk bentley is a big deal uh, well, like he's the headliner name. i've heard the name but i wouldn't know either. i'm not a country uh, fan but that see that's the problem i'm, I'm gonna show my ignorance yeah. and then i'm supposed to direct like i don't know any that of might be music. better because you look at it through fresh eyes though I guess. You know, you're not distracted. But like, you know, I've always thought about if I got a chance to direct for the Foo Fighters or like <laughs> Stone Temple Pilots or something, I'm like, oh, there's a drum solo getting, uh, uh, right. you know, you, camera guy, get you, to the drums. Yeah. You're ready. But then, it, you know, but that's why things are cliche because everybody does the same thing. I suppose. Okay. And I also, before we get back to Brian, yeah. I have new stickers. I see that. Yeah. So I'm going to give you a few. Can they next. order those on the website? Uh I don't want to charge people for the stickers. What? So I've been just giving them out. So if anybody wants any stickers, they should just shoot me a message and I'll get them some stickers. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, Maybe eventually, neat. but you know, I'll, these are like limited edition. Well, remember you're, <laughs> for, you're national for, too. For so hardcore. Yeah. Like self-addressed stamped envelope this or something. Back to Brian. You are at the library now. Kind of take me back in time. You can start, yeah. you can go backwards or you can go forwards and start wherever you, you feel is Sound, appropriate. Sounds good. So, well, since I'm from... Green Bay and really old and and old uh, <laughs> as old just a slightly slightly younger than Elliot but not much so yeah uh, from Green Bay Elliot and I actually took the same bus a couple years sure. to to probably Edis or no to Preble or Morgan L Martin or one of the two anyway so grew up here went to graduate through high school here then went to university here went to UWGB mm -hmm. uh, got my degree in uh, a very very useful degree in history so I left went to Chicago part of the reason I left was because there wasn't a lot going on here there really weren't a lot of jobs that you could do I mean not even throw the history degree out just any college grad kind of job at that time it really wasn't your market if you were in your 20s so I left went to Chicago started as a, an IT headhunter so this is, you know, pre-Y2K, just pre-Y2K. I didn't even know that about Oh, you. yeah. So it was wild. That was a crazy time. Man, you could, like, if you could do an HTML website, you could name your price. Oh, and I had friends who did just that. Yeah. They, they were working out of Chicago. I had a friend, and I, I'm going to misquote the numbers, but let's just say he was making 105000 That's about right. And he left to take something that was 120 or something. Yep, it that's was, about right at that time. <laughs> it was just insane. It's insane. And it was unsustainable. And we, I, I knew that at the time. I don't yeah. know why everybody else didn't. No. <laughs> Maybe but they didn't care. No, and it's so funny now because like a lot of people can build those. Those sites they were building yes. now are just on Drupal, yes. you know, the base of it. And yes. it's so funny. Yeah. But yeah, so I did that for about a year and then right. uh, that stole my soul a little bit. So <laughs> I... <laughs> Very good way of saying that. Yeah. So, so I wound up uh, 
going to regain my soul by by teaching uh, at an at-risk high school in Chicago. So needless to say, I probably learned more than I taught. Uh, sure. You know, growing up in fairly sheltered, fairly homogenous Green Bay. Yeah. And having every possible ethnicity and every possible problem you could think of that these kids are dealing with all thrown at me three times a day, 30 of them yeah. uh, for three hours at a crack. It was intense, but oh. I liked it. I did that for three years. You said that was uh, high school? That was high school, okay. yeah. So yeah. I taught every subject because each kid had their own individual plan and we had a team teachers. So okay. it was like me and two or three other teachers depending on oh. the class. We basically go around each student and see what they're working on and see if it was following their plan and what they needed help with and then teach them a lesson on whatever it was they were going to work on that day. It was pretty intense and it was all levels. That's what was really weird was I would teach math. I would teach some kids how to do long division Mm -hmm. and then I would be two kids down. I would be teaching trigonometry. It was just you, you left and your brain was kind of mushy. The, the problems that the kids had were the things that really pulled at your, at your heartstrings. And, mm-hmm. and uh, that's, in a way, ultimately what made me leave was um, I pulled a kid out of the bathroom with a heroin overdose. Oh, my gosh. And I gave him CPR, and he lived. He lived. The paramedics got there, and they, I found out you know a couple days later that he lived. But I was done. I looked at my head teacher, and I was like, Jack, I'm, I'm done. I'm out. And, uh, right. and I left. The funny part of the story is Jack calls me at home. The, the next day, best part is Jack, this tiny little bald headed old Irishman who used to be a teacher in the public school system. Mm-hmm. And he had that Irish temper, oh, but man. also the Irish humor. And sometimes he'd say things he didn't really realize he was saying. And he, he so, uh, so he calls me and I pick up the phone, you know, hello. And he goes, Brian, where are you? I'm at home. I didn't have sure. a cell phone. This is a landline. I'm like, sure. Jack, where the hell do you think I am? You called my home phone, you know? <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. Well, are you coming in? I said, no, I, I told you yesterday, I'm, I'm, I'm done, I'm out. And he goes, oh, I just thought you meant for the day. <laughs> so I, uh, that burned me out. I just couldn't, couldn't do it anymore. It was the end of the school year, so it was okay. The kids were all moving through. So I actually went then to just down the road from where I, I was teaching to mm-hmm. grad school at Dominican University and got my master's in library science. And then started that career and started in Manitowoc, came back to Wisconsin Mm. and was there for about seven years as the young adult teen services librarian and then moved on to be a director in Delavan and then uh, director in Verona and now executive director here. So I've bounced you, around a bit. You, uh, you know, just glossed over 15 years. Yeah, there is that. So <laughs> that's about right. That's about right. So, yeah. So te- teen services was actually super cool. Um, it was a natural fit coming off of that. And that's what you're doing school. in Manitowoc. Yeah. Okay. So coming off of working with at-risk kids, it was like, oh, God, this is fun and easy. I get to like buy cool music for them to listen to and be introduced to nice. and and you know look at all the young adult literature and buy the stuff that that really these kids are looking to read and and in some cases needing to read and I would do a lot of programming with them so being from the area you kind of know you know the area which really does help mm-hmm. um, so in Manitowoc especially at that time that's when the Miro company was leaving two rivers and sure. had just left the Manitowoc facility a year prior so there was a lot of a lot of kids there that had never and their families had never gone to college these were going to be first generation college students I looked at that and said well we need a program because I was a first generation college student in terms of at least my immediate family Mm -hmm. and my mom and dad had no idea what I was doing and going through and Mm -hmm. I had no idea what to expect. So we need a crash course for both parent and kid. So we did a couple things there that smart, that was really, really beneficial. Both parties loved it. We did it a couple years in a row. I also did an ACT prep class there that we would fill up every time we would do it because the kids there got it. They were like, you know, I need to, the jobs aren't here, they're somewhere else. I have to go go beyond Manitowoc. So I did that for quite a while, and then, like I said, moved on to be a director in Delavan. Delavan's an interesting community. So it's near Lake Geneva. There is a portion of it that's like resort-like, yeah. and then there's a portion of it that's really not. <laughs> and that's the major portion is the yeah. really not portion. And it's a really, really weird dynamic because it's per capita, it's the largest 
Hispanic populated city in Wisconsin. At the time, it was over 33% uh, Hispanic, and most of that was of, of Mexican descent. So you would have Main Street, and on the south side of Main Street was Old Delavan, which was literally old owners in their 60s, 70s, all white. And then you had the opposite side, which was Little Mexico. And the two sides didn't really know what to do with each other. Wow. Um, it was a really interesting, weird dynamic, but fun to serve. Um, but I was, I was there about two years, and then... Did you not deal with any of those issues? Oh, no, we dealt with them. Okay. Um, we actually, we dealt with them. Sometimes they came to us in terms of we were celebrating Cinco de Mayo. Yeah. And we had a Mexican flag draped over a bookshelf with a bunch of mm -hmm. Spanish uh, language books. And uh, let's call him very conservative white gentleman came mm -hmm. in and yelled at us about where the hell is the American flag? And I looked out the window and pointed at the flagpole that it was hanging off of in front of the library. I said, right, right. there, flying like it always is. Right. So we had a lot of those kind of issues pop up. The library was kind of the place where the Hispanic and for that matter, the deaf. So the, the Wisconsin School of the Deaf is also in Delavan. So we had these two very interesting minority groups that were, I don't want to say at odds with the old establishment, but they didn't know what to make of each other. The old establishment didn't know how to deal with the Hispanic group, and they didn't really quite know. They knew the school had been there forever, but they really didn't integrate the deaf into the community. The library was the place where that integration could happen, and we really tried to help that because there was no one on city council that was representative of either of those communities. So we really tried to help pull that in, and through that and just our outreach efforts to the, the established group, we really upped circulation and attendance. I mean, it was like 200% increases just because there was a library that, that cared. Where mm -hmm. previously it was just like we were there, it was a warehouse for materials, but that's not the library of then and it's not the library of today. You really have to be active with your community and let your community kind of dictate what you need to do. So in that case, it was, yeah, we had to do some stuff in Spanish. We had to do sign language story times. Um, or if anything, we had to do story times, but have sign language incorporated so mom and dad know what the heck we're saying. Because the kids are hearing abled, mm -hmm. but mom and dad might not be. So yeah, it was, it was pretty pretty different, but really cool. The two years I was there, it was, it was challenging, but it was cool. I learned a lot. And then the position in Verona opened up, which was, I'd always wanted to kind of get to the Madison area. At that same exact time, like in a week span, Monona, Middleton, and Stoughton all opened up at once. <laughs> so I was like, well, now's the time because those jobs usually never open up. And I applied and I got the Verona job, which was really probably the best one. It wasn't the, it was about the middle of the road paying one, but it's probably the best one for my career. It was a brand new building. It allowed me to see what you really could do if a community put funding toward libraries. Um, we wound up in 2013 winning uh, Wisconsin Library of the Year. Wow. Yeah. So, and, and a lot of that is because of the financial support, but even less than that, the public support coming to the library. We were able to, so I was there seven years, and we were able to really build adult programming and children's programming in a way that I just wasn't able to elsewhere. And that's what I'm hoping to do now that I'm here in Brown County as well, is build that programming out, because that's what people in today's world are looking for. You can find a lot online in terms of information, but you can't find experiences online. You have to be present at something in order to learn with your fellow community members, your fellow um, people of similar interests and ideas. Those are the things that I think really drive a library and drive a community for that matter. In Verona, we were really, really successful at that programming piece. And you said that you won Library of the Year. Like, what's the competition? How many libraries are there? Oh, yeah, good yeah. question. So there's 385 public libraries in Wisconsin, and they range from, you know, your tiny, tiny little library to Milwaukee is mm -hmm. the biggest. And then because it's the entire association, it's all the college, university libraries, the special libraries, any one of those could have won. And we were singled out and... And we won, which was pretty cool. I mean, obviously, it's a good accomplishment. Yeah. But being sort of brand new to it, too. Yeah. I mean, I was probably, what, sixth, seventh year director, yeah. you know, if you add up Delavan and at the time in Verona. 
yeah, we, we did well. We had a really good staff. We had, uh, like I said, a really supportive community. And some of that, we grew that organically because people weren't, we would, you know, when you start doing these programs, they're like, I don't know, what is this? And then it's really word of mouth as you just keep bringing in cool stuff and mm-hmm. stuff they're interested in. And like I said, you got, you have to learn your community and provide what they need. So something as simple as like how to raise chickens in your backyard, coupon clipping, things like that. People would just flock to, and then we could do some bigger things like, oh, what is her name? She used to be on with uh, Larry Mueller. She was the pet expert. Uh, and Patricia McConnell or something like that. Yeah. So we, we had her in and it was like a packed house. I was uh, able to interview a sit down style with Senator Feingold when he wrote the last book about the post 9-11. And we had like 500 people show up for that. That's cool. And we have we had very little seats. It was just this open library space. So people stood around for almost two hours listening. Can to you give chat. him a call for me and tell him to come on? I, I might be able to actually. Yeah, yeah, we, that'd we've, be cool. We've, love that we've stayed in touch. Yeah. <laughs> that, that would be pretty cool. So I am going to actually segue on yeah. that. And then I want to uh, give you the, the remaining time we have left. Yeah, to talk you. about the future, yeah, and uh, maybe a little bit about uh, about Green Bay and your perspective going yeah. back and forth. My other main sponsor is where I actually have another podcast. We were kind of talking about yeah. when you came in, political podcast called Political Radar. People can go to politicalradar.com and they can check out episodes there. And we've been talking to county board people and city council people, and we want to broaden the, the appeal a little the bit, state, so it's federal just, level. Yeah, yeah. so uh, I would love to have Fine Gold on. I would love to have Ron Johnson on. We're very bipartisan yeah uh, i feel like we've we've given our politicians a good platform cool to uh to communicate ideas and and a hopefully people can go to politicalradar.com to check that out we've been doing many many of those there's usually at least one a week this was memorial day week so it was a little bit short so we did not get one out this week but we'll have two next week so it's pretty cool <laughs> back to brian our executive director at the brown county libraries and you work downtown. I do, yep. And which happens to be like right there, right yeah, across like the street from where corner. we are here, down at Camera Corner Studios. I would like to kind of just get your perspective, being a Green Bay guy, yeah, going away, coming back. What have you seen change for better and worse oh, in Green Bay? Everything that I can see has changed for the better. I have yet to see a worse uh, since I've been back. And I was gone 17 years. It's amazing how things have changed. The reasons I left... I would not have left if this stuff would have been here at that time. When I left, we didn't really have a downtown. We've got a downtown now and it's growing. My understanding is it only can grow right now. The housing stock is not what it needs to be for the demand, which is super cool. Businesses are downtown. I would love love to live downtown, but it's too expensive. Right. (laughs) (laughs) Which is nuts. Nobody would have said that when we were kids. No, it was the cheapest place. It was a well, dump. Just to kind of parachute off of that, when we've moved our business to downtown yeah. Green Bay, that's why we moved here. Yeah. It's because we were in the telecom business and T1 lines were cheaper being close to downtown, but also rent was cheap. Right. For business rent, probably like $500 a month. It was yeah, really cheap. Which is really cheap. Yeah. And now that it's not the case no, it'd be, anymore. It'd be easily double that. Yeah. Easily. It's amazing how downtown has really transformed. And in a way that's not just people living in businesses, it's, and when I say business, it's not like the big businesses like Schreiber, but it's also like we have an entertainment district almost with, I think will be anchored with Town because now that the other development is going that direction, going, uh, what would that be, north? And then you go the other direction on Broadway as well that's already established. I mean, really, I look at Broadway as like, wow, this is this is our cool entertainment neighborhood. And then the other side of the river is kind of the industry or the, not even the industry, the business side, the Legal commercial finance, side yeah. of, of the downtown where you've got WPS and you've got mm-hmm. Associated and you've got Schreiber on the east side of the river and you've got Breakthrough Fuel. And so that leads me to my other thing of what's changed. You've got cool businesses here, cool businesses that I would have never in a million years thought could be here. Out in De Pere, you've got Wild Blue, 
a lot of these businesses that you're talking about are service businesses that sort of democratize a lot of expensive services. I mean, sort of like even yeah. what we're doing here, Camera Corner Studios. Yeah. Democratizing audiovisual new media. Yep. Uh, and what ReleaseWire is doing even with yep. uh, in-house doing podcasting. Those are things that obviously 15 years ago, I probably didn't even think about podcasting. But now these are things that almost anybody can do. It is really awesome. And you've got other companies like Shift Visuals they belong in New York or LA. They're pros at what they're doing. And they're just, they're cranking out stuff left and right. It's amazing quality. It blows my mind what Green Bay has, and really the area has become. I'm just really excited. And I guess the way I've explained it before is, when I left, it was like trying to push the 3 million ton boulder up the steepest hill and you were at the bottom of the hill. Now, through work of people that admittedly I wasn't tough enough to tough it out and help push that boulder up that hill along the way. But now I'm here when the boulder's darn near toward the top to help push it over the edge. And it's fun. It is yeah. really, really fun time to be here right now. What are you excited about the next five to 10 years here? I think we're gonna see some new business developments just from some younger folks that have some cool ideas that I can't even fathom, but it's going to happen because we've got some really cool people on the young professional side of things that I've met that are working in all sectors of our economy that at some point are going to say, you know what, it's time for me to do my idea. And while real estate has become a little more pricey here, we're still so much cheaper than everywhere else in the country. If you're already here, you know it's a great spot to start a business because you can't find a cheaper place to be, whether it's for your own rent, for just your own living situation, if you need to downscale that to make your business dream come true. Look at Ashley Prangy. What the heck, a vegan cosmetics company in Green Bay, the land of brats and cheese? (laughs) <laughs> to have a worldwide company come out, that's awesome. Yeah. That is so cool. I think some of the vegans are a result of the broadcast. That, that might be. Yeah, it's probably like, true. Oh, my God. What is wrong with you people? <laughs> <laughs> well, so admittedly, I was vegetarian for a good 18 years, and yeah. then I fell off the bandwagon and, you know, right yeah. under the slaughterhouse floor. But sure. in the next five to 10 years, we're going to see more of that. We're going to see more uh, young professionals in general, because as we age out of the jobs now because we have a a larger nearing retirement population. And as they age out, I think two things are going to happen. One is we're going to see an influx of younger professionals. And if, if I'm lucky, the San Francisco's, the New York's, the Austin's, they've all become so expensive. In the next five years, they're just too darn expensive. People are going to start looking for where's a cheaper place to be that still has some good stuff. And we're developing that good stuff now to capitalize on that in five years. Things like Matt Biro's doing with the public arts, I think we're gonna have more of that and that's gonna be one of many things that are gonna attract young professionals to our area. When you say young professionals, yeah. I don't know that everybody means the same thing when they say that. It's a good point. To me, I think it's about entrepreneurs. And sometimes young professionals are just, you know, they're people that work at a bank, right? Yeah. So I don't feel like our local banks are going to grow in terms of numbers of people. Right. So I feel like there has to be more entrepreneurism. I think a little of both. I don't think the banks are going to grow, but I think the people working at the banks now that are older are going to retire and yeah, they need yeah. the backfill. And then I think... And I hate to pick on banks. It's not... Right. Yeah. Uh, just any company. Yeah, yeah. I mean, in our area, it's, it's, yeah. an, it's an aged workforce. Yep. There's going to be a really good opportunity for someone younger to move up the ladder fairly rapidly, I feel, because the opportunities are going to be there. And it's a place where you can come and start out and still afford to do fun things because it's pretty cheap to live. I do also agree there's going to be more entrepreneurialism. And I think some of that is whether it's young professionals or or people who retire and say, now I can do what I've always wanted to try because now I'm good. I, I don't have to work for my employer. I know my retirement's safe. I've got this other money I want to try this thing with. Let's do it. I think there's going to be quite a bit of that too. I think we have, I mean, we still have that growing up here, as you know, there's a lot of mill worker millionaires and that kind of has transitioned into mill work has become different. And Mm -hmm. there's a lot of opportunity for someone to say, Hey, I'm set, but I've got this money. I want to try something with, I want to play around and let's see if I can make this business. 65 is not that old anymore. The other angle of it 
uh, is some of these you know younger kids and they're going through these programs that you're talking about yep. i want to see us and I, I guess it's a little bit political but uh the the packer stadium refund money that we have coming to the community i'd like to see that spent on a shark tank fund that would be that, awesome that we could have that'd be pretty cool 10 small micro businesses get 20 to fifty thousand dollars yeah as like a line of credit or starter capital or whatever something like that yeah have some advisors ha- you know have you and me on the board right we, we, right we, right we, we pick the businesses out I'm dead serious. And they, they promised me they were going to put it on the list of things they vote for, at least at, okay. at City Hall. But okay. uh, we'll see. The other idea is to me, they're either like only for summer or mm-hmm. they're giving a bunch of a big chunk of money, putting it, putting all their eggs in one basket, so to speak. We only have 100,000 people in Green Bay proper. And I know you're talking Brown County most of the time. Well, even that is not that but much. But it's not that it's, much, it's right? It's 250,000. So a so million dollars is a lot of money. Is a ton of money. In this community. So, uh, you know, so I always like to really think it, hedge our bets a little bit and invest in some new things. And I would love to see that happen. I, I could see that. I like that yeah. idea too, because uh, I think the thing you you struck on that really rings true with me is new things. That's the piece that I see happening in Green Bay. It's still a little bit of a struggle, which it is anytime there's change, right? It's happening. There's a piece too, there's a certain age demographic on our elected boards and our elected bodies for the most part. More folks are over 40 than they are 40 or under, right? Take that. Well, okay. So, <laughs> so, so 50. <laughs> How about that? So no, it's all good. That is also going to change just as time goes on. And I don't think it's, it's not an ageism thing. It's a, where did I grow up? How did I grow up? What was my expectation of Green Bay and this area of that time? So I'm 41. When someone my age gets elected, I think there's different expectations of what the future needs to be. Probably very much like when those folks who got elected when they were younger and are now older thought, what are their expectations of where Green Bay needs to be? But it it was different times, Mm -hmm. right? I think we're going to see some of that happen just as time moves on. Attrition, yeah. Uh, Yeah, just some attrition happened. And the area will take a turn, not for better or worse, just a turn toward whatever is that particular focus of the body that's there. So I think we're going to see some of that happen as well. It's going to be cool. I'm really excited for this area because I remember it when there was no downtown. It was, it was a ghost town. No, I remember riding my bike as a kid and there was the mall. Yeah. But that just slowly went downhill slowly. And then all of a sudden, right. Right. (laughs) And then uh, there was the exclusive company. Yep. Which still is there. Thank thank you, Tom Smith. But that's it. Yeah. (laughs) That was it. (laughs) There's nothing else down here. And it was a little bit scary to have to go to the exclusive company (laughs) sometimes. Broadway was not what Broadway is now. No, I mean, it was a different Broadway. Yeah, and my um, son is 12, and I've never, the whole time he's been around, I've never felt the way that I felt back then, Yeah, you know, for him. Yep. So it's it's transformed, yeah. Yeah, Broadway was true to the name. There were some broads <laughs> on Broadway. There were some women of the night. I, I, I have no <laughs> idea what you're talking about. <laughs> I'm too young to get it. Yes, that's true. It's probably true. Right. We used up our hour. So I only have a couple more things. Okay. I would like your top things that you would like to see the library do in the next few years. Wishlist is, uh, we've done it's a smidge of it already. We've, we're uh, about 95% done. We're just waiting on dope back ordered doors. So we're, we've got occupancy of the, the basement in central, the central facilities. So there's a 300 person auditorium down there. Mm-hmm. Most people don't know that. And you can use it as the public. You can book it. Um, How would they do that? They, they can do it right online. They can just okay. go to our website and there's a feature on our website to book our, our facilities. Otherwise, if you just don't feel like doing that, give us a call. And, and what does that cost? Depending on um, if it's nonprofit or not and okay. that kind of so anywhere from zero dollars to I think it's 400 total for the day. Oh, wow. Okay, yeah, it's cheap. cheap. The auditorium is newly renovated. It's decked out in brand new seats from KI. When uh, did that happen? Last month. So from oh. April 26th to May 26th, Zizi Construction came in and I could not foresee how they were going to do this in a month. And they gutted the entire public portion of the basement yeah. and redid it and it's amazing it wasn't horrible but it wasn't good yeah I mean, um so i mean we made some really big improvements wow what was bad down there was there was the auditorium but it had seats from 1972 everything was original while you could say that was kind of cool and retro it didn't work so well 
Um, so we have a new sound system. We have professional Great. LED stage lighting. Wow. We've got a uh, new projector. It's a laser projector. So you can have all the lights on and it looks crystal clear on the screen. It's really, really great. We put in epoxy floor down there. So if things get spilled, big deal. We just wipe them up. Nice. Uh, carpet squares down the aisles. So again, we can just put in a new square. We're all good. Wow. Um, we redid the big the meeting rooms outside of that auditorium. Uh, we opened the walls up, so we're getting retractable glass walls. So you can either portion it off into like three rooms or you can open it all up into one big room. It really lends itself to more more events, more especially so we're gonna try to do so here's a one wish list thing, some after hours events for adults. Huh. So I would really like to So that um, I can spill some drinks on your floor. You can spill some drinks on the floor. Right. And to that end probably have some alcoholic drinks there because the parks in the county parks there's ways to do that mm -hmm. and with the county library it's really not that much different so we're hoping to do some kind of events down there oh, yeah, I think um, great. we have been talking with a group that wants to do a pop-up restaurant as like a mm -hmm. full evening in the library kind of thing which would be really fun i would love to see either getting some bands touring bands to come because it's a 300 person auditorium you know uh like backstage of Meyer is a little too small the Meyer itself is enormous mm -hmm. so this is not that far away the from 300 those, would the 300 be, is a I think nice be good for size. i think it'd be good for local bands I it really, would be too i, I really yeah. like pushing the local scene it's so. chocolatiers and the yeah. the what is it raglanders yeah. and we have um, lots we have lots right? yeah bands. And I used to be in those local bands. That's why I left. You know, I was sure. I was one of those guys in their early twenties or even younger, probably sixteen. Well, you'd get your three or four bands. fans if you got up on stage. I probably would now. <laughs> <laughs> My daughter still lives here. Yeah, she's only I'd thirteen. Show up, but I mean, <laughs> there'd be free beer, right? Maybe. Yeah. Maybe. That, I mean, that I could get happened. you a free beer. Yes, that's <laughs> that's what I mean. Then I'd be. That's there. all that. Yeah. <laughs> so I'd <laughs> yeah, like to do. Yeah, I'd guys. like to do like cool stuff like that. And that's then, amazing. And like I think that's have, great. have comedians, have things, maybe smaller plays. That'd yeah. be really fun. And uh, I'm hoping to do that. It's a wish list item. Other wish list items. Some are necessities, but still kind of on the wish list because they're going to cost a lot. So one is uh, our East facility, East Branch facility has been there 30 years it's aged and it shows we will be getting new furniture at almost all of our branches so that's gonna it's gonna spruce it up a little but that doesn't spruce up the building itself and where it's it's just part of it is it's simply too small when you look at how bellevue has grown in 30 years that facility has not grown at all bellevue has exploded in 30 right. years right. so we really need a facility that's somewhere in the 20,000 square foot range not the 7,000 square foot range. And, and where's that one located right now? Currently it's on Main, just so it's past the Main and uh, Mason intersection. China Buffet. Oh, I know where it is. Kind of near there. there. <laughs> a little further down. I was yeah. telling him away he would. Yeah. yeah. Or Gnome Games. They, yes, yeah. Gnome Games, directly next they to Gnome Games. Things have to be explained in very simple terms for this guy. Yes. That's okay. I navigate the whole town on fast food restaurants. <laughs> Three blocks from McDonald's, no. one block from Taco I, Bell. I, I Love was, it. I was going to put it in terms of Taco Bell and Starbucks. Yeah, yeah. that works. <laughs> so there, it's, it's kitty corner to Starbucks right. and across the street from Taco Bell. Right, right, right. <laughs> so that facility needs to expand and then, and just be renovated in general. So we'll probably be looking for a new facility to put that in because our lease is up there February 2018. So we may or may not have time to do so that. So what's your wish list on that? You want to move further into Bellevue? You want? You know, to I don't really care where we move to as long as it's within that kind of east side area. Bellevue would be great. Staying in the east side of Green Bay would be great. Maybe there's even some property that works out correctly in Ledgeview. I don't know. You know, we need to really look into this stuff a little deeper. And we're starting to, actually. Uh, the library board has is, is, uh, got a little ad hoc committee that we're starting to look into this. But we do need to probably in the, I'd say, $6 million to $8 million range to do a, a library of that size. Even if we rent to build out, it's gonna cost a lot to do it right. So there's that. And then the other wish list piece in terms of structures is the downtown facility. Like I said, we renovated that basement public portion and the elevators are now like time machines. In one floor, you go from 1972 mm -hmm. to 2016. I think they're run by flux capacitors. The rest of the building needs to be updated. So what we did down there was pretty much cosmetic. I mean, we ripped out old things. We put in new things. We put up paint, carpet. It needs more than that. 
like I said, it's 44 years old. It has 44 year old problems. So we just, uh, that last rainstorm last Friday, a week from yesterday, week from today, we had about 24 storm drains mm. that are on the roof. So mm-hmm. they're kind of like your gutters with a flat roof. It just runs drains. through the whole building, this whole spider web of, yeah. of iron pipes. Well, iron pipes wear out after some time, especially oh, no. 44 years. And these have happened before, but this was a big one. A little crack, you know, well, there's a little little bit of water. Yeah. And we're like, oh, can you put a put a, a trash can out, sure. put another trash can out. It grows a little and put another trash can out and all of a sudden it erupts. And it's about a six foot rift in the top of the pipe with all that pressure of that water running through it. It was just 55 gallon after 55 gallons coming out of that thing. We just had to wait for it to be done. We filmed it. So if there's any. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah. So if there's any supervisors listening, you will be getting this video shortly. <laughs> yeah. I will be sending you guys that video <laughs> uh, just to show you that it's more than the it's, cosmetic thing. It's things. not going into Brian's pizza fun. Right. Exactly. <laughs> so our guys are great, though. I mean, they had that cleaned up within a day. They had it dried. They had it ozoned so it doesn't smell. Replacing the pipe, though, that's a feat because mm-hmm. those things are heavy and mm-hmm. they're up in weird corridors that you got to crawl into and just getting it out is is problem so that's why i'm going to as we talk about renovating cent- the central facility i'm going to be talking about a substantial renovation and i'm going to push that and that's a good example of why because if we do an 80 percent renovation and we don't deal with some of those things we're going to deal with them one day or another. And do we deal with it after all the good things are in there and they're wrecked then? Or do we do it while we could have? And yes, it's going to cost a lot of money, but it's going to cost us even more money to fix the stuff and then do it a little by little by little by little. Because every time you bring somebody in to fix that, it's it costs a lot because it's not in an easy spot. When we've got everything ripped apart, right. now is when you do it. When you have this plan put together, yes, will you come back and talk, Definitely. talk through it with me? Definitely. Okay. And what I always close with and what I always ask everybody is if we have somebody else there and you're over here with me or maybe without me, you know, <laughs> who would you want to hear? Ooh, who would you want to be interviewed? Who would I want? That's a good question. Can't be Aaron Rodgers. No, no, he no, no. He said no. no. What, what about Olivia? He's like, I'm with Olivia and like we're... <laughs> Like, we've got a new dog. Yeah, I we, saw have a, we have a and, dog and there's yeah. stuff going on in California. What? <laughs> <laughs> the woman who runs Seize the Day events. Well, I'll, I, I'll look it up and yeah, I'll, I'll she, hunt her down. She helped put the Brian Johnson uh, thing together that we did for the roast and everything. Oh, was she one of the ones that... She sp- wasn't one of the roasters. She just okay. kind of coordinated the whole oh. thing within like a week. She had okay. this amazing event pulled together. Okay. Um, oh, why am I drawing no, that's Katie? But, Katie, yes. That's I cool. don't have a last name, but I have Katie. Yes. <laughs> yes. So, Katie, we'll, we're going to hunt you down. We're yeah. going to get you on. Um, and maybe Brian will be here and we'll grill you. That'd be awesome. Yeah. <laughs> you have any closing thoughts? Just come take a look at the library, if, especially if you haven't been there in a while. It's no matter what location you're at, we're more than books these days. I think you're going to be pleasantly surprised what you're going to get with service. It's different than what you might remember. Awesome. Thank you, Brian Simon. Thank you. Executive director. Thank you so much. Don't forget to run over to iTunes and Stitcher and give a rating and review of the show. It helps other people find us. Cheers.